So let's talk about how we can actually make those networks a little bit smaller. And networks in networks are a convenient strategy for doing this. So if you look at the picture, you basically see that there's a multi-layer perceptron inserted as intermediate layers in my convolutional network. And that sounds like an abstruse and peculiar and strange idea. And as a matter of fact, when that idea was published, people didn't quite appreciate the impact of it. Let's have a look at why it actually matters. So if we look at the last layers in LUNET, well, they're not that big, right? I mean, it's basically just, you know, 120 hidden units, 84 and then 10. So that wasn't a big deal relative to whatever came before. But if we move on to AlexNet or VGG, well, those things actually get quite massive. So if you look at the last layer just connecting from the convolution, well, you have number of channels times the width and the height of the last uh, resolution, you know, that you get before you go dense. And in Lunet, that was 48,000 parameters. In AlexNet, that was 26 million parameters. So that's about, you know, three orders of magnitude more. And in VGG, it was four times again that number. So that's pretty bad. Whereas convolutions were actually kind of well behaved. It's, you know, input times output times, you know, con convolutional kernel size. So if you had, you know, a kernel size of three, then, you know, that's, you know, nine. So it's nine times input times output. That's quite well behaved. But those last layers are the ones that really made life hard. So the question is, of course, how can you fix it? And the issue is, in the end, you need to produce something that is, you know, for dimensionality that matches the number of classes that you have. So at some point, you need to go from a two-dimensional times, you know, number of channels representation to something that's a vector. And the challenge is, how do you do that? So let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. If I print the size distribution for VGG, you can see that as I'm going from sequential five, so this is basically the last convolutional block, so that's 512 channels with seven by seven, to a 4096 dimensional output, well, that eats a lot of memory. Now, one way to address this is to get rid of those fully connected last layers. Well, that sounds quite easy in theory, but how do you do it in practice? The problem is convolutions and pooling reduce the resolution, so you keep on having things, but then at some point you still need to map to this, you know, number of classes dimensional object. And so at the same time, you also need to have some degree of nonlinearity to mix and transfer the information between the various channels into a representation that works for the number of classes. And this is exactly where one by one convolutions come in. As we saw before, they only act per pixel on all the channels. So this is really a multi-layer perceptron applied to pixel-wise activations. And so if in the end you only have maybe a 5 by 5 activation, well, resolution, then this really allows you to get a large amount of already per channel information quite nicely presented in the form that will tell you how many classes you need. Now, in the very last layer, essentially they just got rid of it. So rather than bothering with one last dense layer, they just perform global average pooling in order to take care of things. And that worked rather nicely. So if you look at it again, well, the one by one convolution is just a multi-layer perceptron. And that's what addressed things. So this led to something called the NIN block, network in network block. So you basically have a convolution followed by two one by one convolutions. And those act in the same way as you would have a dense layer. You repeat that a few times. And so you get the following architecture. So the NIN net had a number of, you know, convolutions followed by one by one convolutions max pooling in order to reduce the resolution and you did that three times in order to get 
a meaningful network in networks network. And this completely got rid of the dense layer. So that's the contribution of network in network networks. They didn't perform quite as well as VGG, which is one of the reasons why people initially overlooked it. But they were a key component in order to go to things like Inception or ResNet, which we're going to cover in the next few lectures. But just to compare in the end, so rather than the dense layer, you just had <coughs> those multi-layer perceptrons and then average pooling. So to summarize things, what you get is you get this dimensionality reduction. So you can see you go from 96 to 256 channels to 384 channels, which then keeps on getting reduced further and further until we have something that's 5 by 5. Then you drop down to, in this case, 10 dimensions because it's a 10 dimensional classification problem. You perform global average pooling, you drop the remaining few dimensions, and there you go. That's all you need. So, in conclusion, what we cover today is Lunette. So, this was the first convolutional neural network. Then we moved on to AlexNet, which was just bigger and better and better. VGG was bigger still. And then, which offered a constructive alternative to those behemoth dense layers. In the next lecture, we will then see how all those ideas can be combined to get inception, and then by further refinement of the function classes, we would get to ResNet and ResNext. But that's topic for the next lecture.